so uh, lots of food for thought from our two first uh, speaker sessions and I'm looking forward to diving deeper into those topics now with our panelists. Um, so the first person I would like to hear from is Alexia, the founder of Your Juno. So Daniel illustrated how cash is starting to move closer to digital assets like stocks and cryptocurrencies, and these are actually becoming more accessible to everyone. However, like he said, with that, um, it's also a lot of complexity that is added and knowledge is needed to leverage those trends. And like robo advisors, for example, like he mentioned, are one response to this new need for knowledge. So Alexia, what are your thoughts around how this newly needed knowledge is distributed and what is needed in your opinion to successfully create financial inclusion? Over to you. Thank you so much for the introduction um, and thank you for inviting me as a panel on this, on this discussion. Um, I think looking at the current financial education space, what I'm really struggling with is to see that a lot of it has been created for SEO purposes and for as a, as a stream of customer acquisition. Um, and so when you're an individual and you're trying to get informed and get educated around the different means of investing or crypto that exist, oftentimes you're not necessarily going to find unbiased education. And what I find fascinating is that the fintech industry is absolutely booming and access to all of these opportunities is being wildly democratized, but we're really missing the first step, which is spreading education on how to use the existing tools. Um, it's one of the most incentivized industries. And I think if you compared it to the medical industry, we would immediately see all the red flags. Um, if you went to see your doctor because he is a business, he has a business that produces certain pills and he was just using basically the, the consultation with you as a means to sell you his own pills, that would be seen as, as very misaligned incentivized. And that's what we're seeing currently in the financial industry is that a lot of the education, a lot of the consultations are actually held by people that are then trying to give you a sales pitch and then trying to get you to use their products or services. Um, and having access to unbiased financial education is incredibly expensive because that would mean that you have to go to see a financial advisor. So we need more companies to come in and really provide unbiased financial education. Um, and I'm not quite sure what the landscape in Sweden looks like, but I know that in the UK, there's a couple of these websites that already exist where the way that they provide the knowledge is by completely separating the editorial from the commercial team. And so in the editorial side of things, you will have access to purely unbiased financial education and knowledge without trying to give you access to any products. And then the commercial team will give you the sort of commission and kickback of getting you onto another website, but they're kept completely separate. And I think we need to see a lot more of this. Then I would say as a second point, in terms of increasing financial inclusion, we need to make sure that the products that are being created at the moment are also reflective of the general population and of all the different lived experiences that subgroups have. Um, if we look currently at fintechs, most of them are created by um, white men, which is not necessarily a problem, but it'd be good if we could see more women, more people of color, people that are targeting elderly people, for example, creating solutions that really suit their needs, because otherwise we end up with products that are created by same minds and that have the same problems at, at heart, but that don't necessarily target everyone and that don't necessarily solve everyone's problems. Yeah, thank you so much for all of that insight, Alexia. Um, the next question, I'm going to go to, uh, to you, Matthias. Um, as Per said, the finance sector used to be dominated uh, almost entirely by banks. And as we heard and all know by now, uh, this has changed and fintech companies are now entering the field fast and aggressively. So uh, Matthias, my question to you, how do these new trends have and are creating an empty space and needs uh, for solutions that go beyond what banks can offer? So I think that is an interesting question in, in, uh, in two ways. Um, uh, I think the experience from, so at Uni, uh, we are, um, our customers consist of uh, digital companies, more or less, entirely. And so our operation, our neobank operation, if you will, is entirely business to business, and we're catering to 
many of these heroes driving growth in the economy. Um, and uh, those are direct consumer companies, performance marketing companies, but what they all have in common is that they are using the digital rails or the digital real estate to reach their customers. And uh, it, as such, they are pushing the forefront of both payments, but also how to do digital business. Uh, but it's important to appreciate, and coming back to Per's uh, um, initial uh, thoughts here from, from uh, our, the Swedish Riksbank, uh, the development for, for cash or for payments in our world has gone from, for, for these companies, they grew up in the last few years, so they have never been in an economy without digital, that's the first thing. Um, but also if you even if you look at their ancestors if you will the the companies that preceded them they they don't really have a cash experience either many of them so so many of them actually come from a situation where bank transfers were sort of uh, the go-to experience um where we do have a difference is in obviously in retail and the retail that is um that is getting more and more digital i think uh um what is interesting here is when you start thinking about the symbol, the money as a symbol and how that is going to change things. So for our customers, um, the traditional e-commerce merchant, uh, the symbol of buying something even in retail is no longer symbolized by a coin or a, or a, or a, or a bill. It is uh, the, 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 the primary virtual symbol that we're using is the card. So that is, and I also noticed that uh, with our, the, the recent, um, the New Order presentation here, when representing payments, there was not a cash payment. Even, he was, even when talking about cash, it was a symbol of a card. And I think that, that part of society is really, really interesting. And when we're losing our sort of connection to the symbol, I think it's interesting uh, with the e-corona, of course, but I think when we're losing our connection to the to the symbolized value that cash is, then we also get a disconnect for what is money, really. And I think it is upon the fintech industry, and I think Gimme has done brilliantly in their target audience with parents and, and children, obviously, to, to give this some some real thoughts about what, what are the symbols that actually gives us the idea of, of value exchanging hands and i think there's uh, a long way to go so i have a i have a sort of an anthropological perspective on on on, on world uh, at large and i think both rituals are important but also symbols are important and i think this is where we can actually do all do better so at uni uh, the card and the virtual card and the fact that we're also, as a sort of byproduct, send out uh, physical cards to people just to make them aware of being uh, a customer. That is how we sort of reconnect with money and transfer money. But we have completely lost. We're, we're so many generations away from cash, per se. So we need to reinvent that from a design perspective, from a symbol, uh, symbol perspective. And I think it is upon the fintech industry and the neobank to actually do that. And to be honest, I don't think we have done it well enough yet because we need to understand that value is exchanging hands and that needs to be symbolized. Thank you so much. Uh, can I go to Sebastian and ask you, what are your thoughts on this question? Yeah, sure. Uh, hope you can hear me still. Yes, perfect. So uh, you mentioned that, that empty space and needs and I, uh, you know, from the consumer perspective or business perspective, perspective, I think, you know, that empty space and need in one way has, has always been there. Uh, it's, it's just now that, that the tech world is, um, is uh, you know, enabled to, uh, to enter the finance, finance world. And if there are things to be refined and and to make more efficient problems to be solved or or ultimately value to be created, I think you know for end consumers and businesses, it's just a matter of time before it's going to happen. Uh, from my perspective, and um, you know, it's uh, just I I just see like the beginning of this. I I had a hard time remembering like how it was 10 years ago all these companies shown in the presentations almost non-existed so it's just recently that the finance world has opened up to the tech world and and kind of uh 
um, made it possible for tech to, to catch up and be, um, be able to create this value. So I think it's just uh, super interesting times. We've just seen the beginning of, uh, of, uh, of this. And um, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's about my thoughts on that. Thank you for those perspectives. Um, Alexia already shared her thoughts around the role of uh, knowledge distribution regarding the new trends. Uh, Paul, what are your thoughts on that question? Uh, yeah, well, I think, I mean, first of all, there is an awful lot of change that's happened. If we look just at how uh, finances have been managed, how money has been viewed by individuals, but also how society have looked after individuals. Um, areas such as uh, pension management, uh, having an understanding that the state will look after you as you get older, these forces are disappearing, uh, disappearing rapidly, and it becomes more and more important for individuals to look after their financial well-being and understand, therefore, what it means to look after their, their money. I think Daniel had some very good uh, statements in his presentation, but the thing that actually got me at the end was very correctly what he said around knowledge and insights and also around guidance. And I think this is where we are failing dramatically, and I don't think it's you know, down to the banks or, or whatever else, there's, there's still an area that needs to be worked out here. And that's the fact that we are being inundated with um, perceived knowledge when it comes to money management, investment, and it's proliferated uh, and, and growing substantially, driven by, as, as has already been said, people who are trying to monetize on the back of um, inviting people into, in a way, falsify the understanding how to manage their money. So I think it really comes down to finding ways to drive correct knowledge, separated from um, for profit organizations, which creates a, a dilemma for most fintechs and, and most organizations that are trying to reap benefit out of the back of individuals engaging onto their platforms and their apps. But more importantly, drive insights that will enable uh, individuals that are getting the knowledge to know whether the knowledge they are receiving is valuable knowledge for them, truthful knowledge for them. Let's be honest. I mean, fake news is still fake news, but even more these days, fake insights into your money management, the world of money and financial literacy is even worse, right? It could and probably will have a systemic uh, negative impact on our uh, financial lives. So I think it's it's critical for us to take advantage of new technologies, allow both fintechs and banks, but also society to put together capabilities that will enable individuals to make um, well-educated decisions and selections in what at the end of the day is a fundamentally emotional subject around money, uh, and more importantly, what we're talking about is uncertainty. None of us know what the future look like. We, we know what money we've got, but we don't know what the impact is and the risks of the investments we are making. So we need to find ways to enable individuals to really get insight rather than just knowledge. Thank you. Yeah, the next question is uh, hitting up on that as well. For those of us that don't have their own financial advisors, like me, for example, um, the overload of information out there can be uh, intimidating and overwhelming. And often it's really hard to access trustworthy information, as we stated. Um, Alexia and Polina, uh, Per explained Riksbanksen's role in ensuring that payments can be made securely and efficiently. What needs do you see to ensure that these technologies lead to actual democratization of finances and actually help us navigate in the constant flow of information? Polina, maybe you want to go first. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, well, first of all, thank you guys for organizing this. It's super important, really. And I'm really glad that you invited me as I think uh, me and Alex are uh, the youths here representing uh, the youths as well. We have a network uh, full of actually the Nordic's biggest network for youth that are interested in uh, futuristic topics and technology and how the world is moving forward. So we asked our youths uh, some questions uh, in regards to this um, uh, panel discussion. And it's interesting that uh, around 80% of our youths uh, actually thought that they had uh, their uh, money 
and uh, knowledge about their money and private economy in control, but still a, around 70 to 80% were uh, more interested in finding knowledge and guidance in regards to how to navigate. And, and they agreed that there is a lot of uh, uh, flow of, inf of information sorry, going on and uh, where this flow of information comes from, uh, in their opinion, are uh, from schools, first of all, and there it's, uh, it's both uh, that people uh, and youths feel that they are getting enough information and knowledge and guidance about how to use and navigate in, in the economy, but there's also a lot of youths not finding enough uh, uh, support. Uh, and that's why I think it's super important that there are these uh, different communities and networks that support the minorities of uh, everybody uh, so we can really ensure that we're democratizing uh, the knowledge and, and just the, the support of all these different fintechs and the apps and the different trends, for example, on TikTok. Uh, we have a lot of youths uh, finding information and trends, and that's not always really trustworthy, but still, since it's easily access, uh, accessible, a lot of youths feel that that, that is a, a right information to, to use and, and navigate. Uh, and that's why it's super important, again, that the schools keep up. If the schools don't keep up, keep up that the organizations and different communities involved to uh, ensure the minorities are also up to date. And then uh, my third point is, uh, or my, uh, what I wanna mention is the parents role. That is super important. And if we can't reach directly to the youths, we can reach to the parents that later can discuss and parents are uh, a trust for a lot of youth. So that's why I think it's important to, uh, to reach out to them as well. Uh, yeah, and then social media, of course, it's uh, super important. Again, there it's easy accessible information and that's what youths uh, feel are, are uh, the easiest way to navigate. Uh, and I think that's why it's also important for bigger organizations uh, to, to be up to date with that uh, trends and, uh, and reach out to youths there. Thank you. Alexia, do you want to share? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think it's, it's a really interesting one, the, the idea of, of financial education. And what you mentioned before with not having a financial advisor is basically the position that I went into when I started Juno. Um, I'm, I've studied finance and I worked in finance, so I was quite financially educated, but I looked at my friends and I was thinking, they don't have financial advisors and they don't have the means to pay for a financial advisor. Where can they go to get financially educated? And the biggest friction points that came out is the fact that like you mentioned, there is a massive overwhelm of financial education. And like Daniel pointed out, there's also an absolute overwhelm of financial companies providing services and then no one really knows what they do or how to use them. And so we thought with Juno, we need to tackle the problem in a two-step process. The first of all is education and really teaching people what is a share, for example, like the absolute fundamentals of investing. And then as a second step, we need to match them with the right institutions that would suit their needs best. Um, and I think when it comes to education, what we're really lacking at the moment is this idea of personalized financial education. Um, a lot of the resources that exist out there are one size fits all. Um, and if you compare it to a language learning process, for example, no one, would think that learning German, for example, should be the same process for everyone. There's some people that are really well educated and some people that don't know anything at all. And they would go through a different learning process and learning journey. When it comes to finances, it's the exact same. Someone that has lots of debt should not be learning about investing. And someone who's got lots of savings might not need to know a lot about how credit card debt works because they might never take it out. And so what we've decided to do with Juno is really create an app that does personalized financial education in the same way that you would learn a language where you first assess someone's financial situation and where they're at and then from there you build a personalized learning path that takes you through exactly what you need to know at a given time and I think that really removes this whole overwhelm that you might have when you first go on the internet and you try and google anything about finance and there's so many resources out there that you don't even know where to start. And then I think once people are educated and they understand how certain topics work, you need to match them with the right solutions. Um, and I think 
I would love to see more companies becoming sort of the, the bridges between certain groups and financial services. Um, I do know we focus on women specifically, so we try and understand really what are the services that exist out there that would best benefit women in certain situations and bridge that gap. Um, but I think what we need to see more of is people that understand the landscape that Daniel pointed out, for example, in Sweden, with all those companies that know what they are and that are able to connect the dots between your average person that doesn't know finance and what they might need most in, in that big circle that he showed. Um, so yeah, I think it's- a I'm so sorry. I think, uh, I don't want to cut you off, but I think we need to uh, move yeah. on because we still have uh, quite, it's really interesting. I feel like we could talk about this forever. We have a few more questions. Uh, I ask you if possible, uh, just uh, keep these ones uh, a bit shorter um, because of time, time concerns. Um, but we can read and hear a lot and we heard a lot about new FinTech solutions that work B2C and we've talked about uh, how they help customers. Um, now we're, we're kind of diving into what happens when new fintech solutions also go B2B and what do companies need for a smooth trans transformation to utilize these new solutions? Um, Sebastian, would you share your thoughts on this one? Yes, uh, sure. So I think, um, uh, so there was basically two questions in that, uh, uh, what I heard, what, what happens when fintech solutions go B2B is that, um, you know, at least from what I see, there's two things going on and, uh, you know, B2B um, trailing a little bit behind B2C. So B2C is a little bit ahead. B2B, that's usually the case in, in, in many sectors. But uh, what is happening in the B2B space is that the infrastructure is kind of building and then suddenly uh, new solutions come out to the, to the public or to, to the end consumers, that is businesses. Uh, at least um, leveraging, you know, more efficient uh, solutions for themselves, um, be able to uh, to move uh, swiftly, uh, keeping up to competition, etc. And what they need, uh, what I say, we we talk to a lot of businesses uh, every day, hundreds uh, basically. Um, I think it, it needs a, a bit of a, you know shift in mindset and be able to to be bold and dare and and you know uh, decentralized decision making on to to other parts of the of the organization that can make decisions to maybe try new things out and of course uh, not everything is going to work out but uh, at least i think you know you have to be agile in your way of transforming and adapting new technology information as a company, no matter what sector. And lastly, I would just want to mention uh, what, what we also see is that a lot of fintechs is using a lot of fintechs to build their fintech product. And solutions lie beyond, you know, uh, when you come up with, you know, the first iteration of, a, of your solution product, uh, suddenly you, you open up for more uh, possibilities, opportunities within the fintech. So what I see everything, you know, around the B2B segments, at least, at, uh, at least is that it's just growing exponentially fast. The more innovation, uh, you know, nurtures more innovation in this space. And so, as I said before, like it, it is just the beginning. Everything is moving faster by the day. Thank you. Um, so Daniel also shared how buy now, pay later holds the possibility to leverage cash uh, to optimize an individual's economy. Um, but this once again requires knowledge distribution. So Christopher, what do you see as the downsides to trends like BNPL if knowledge is not a given? And what do we need to ensure to protect the next generation from those risks? Well, the clear downside by uh buy now, pay later, is that you create a learned pattern in many times young individuals that uh, it's okay to spend more money than you actually have. And you're really motivating people to make bad financial decisions, which can have devastating consequences on their economy. Uh, so on one hand, adults should be able to make a decision themselves if they want to take on credit. But on the other hand, this is becoming a quite big societal problem and people are getting in depth and ending up with, uh, with depth at Kronofogden uh, and so on. So I'm a bit torn. Uh, I think the steps which has been taking, like the law 
uh, in 2020 that said you can't offer buy now, pay later as a uh, primary alternative when checking out in an online store, as an example. Uh, that could be a solution, but I think the, the problem is more complicated than that. Because uh, you see, this is, this is really a pattern in our society uh, and it's ingrained in the mon modern um, monetary system. So even countries operate this way. They spend more money than they have, and then they borrow money from the central bank to cover that debt. So we really need to start educating um, people, and especially young people, about uh, the risks uh, associated with it. And good ways to do that is using platforms that are offering credit, like Klarna example, they have a huge platform with a lot of people using their app, their services, and there they can really utilize uh, the technology and also the uh, trend that is right now that more people are wa wanting to get smarter with money and using apps and tools to get smarter with money. But the most important thing and the most valuable thing, I think, is to educate in school. I think there should be a class in school that handles uh, and goes over what money is, what taxes is, how you take a loan, should you take a loan, uh, what happens if you cannot repay a loan. Uh, all those things you should learn from an early age because uh, that's something you're going to have to make a decision over when you get older. And the uh, current um, education system isn't really teaching that right now. So uh, improving financial liter literacy is definitely a way forward. Yeah, thank you. That's interesting perspectives. Polina, you probably have a little bit of a different perspective. What are your thoughts on the same question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, I agree a lot with Christopher, what he said, and uh, absolutely knowledge is uh, super important to educate about the risks. And yeah, that is the biggest risk that the youth, uh, they uh, end up with debt when it's uh, easy to pay uh, later and take credit for uh, con uh, consummation. Uh, but well, my perspective in this uh, is the social view as well. And that is that uh, there's a lot uh, of trends again about how many people earn a lot of money, how uh, they're investing and how they're having a very positive relationship to money. Uh, but there is not enough uh, information and, and just uh, people talking about the negative sides from a social perspective. So individuals that have actually debt, for example, or uh, Kronofogden, that uh, there's a lot of youths increasing in debt. But that information, I don't think it's uh, quite accessible for, for the youths to know about, that they are not alone in these problems. And I think that is important to write uh, to to, um, to raise that question and talk about it on a social perspective. And, th and that, I mean, in social medias, uh, with, uh, with people that are role models, uh, as well as in school, like talk about it, like have you, uh, like share within the class, like if somebody has uh, uh, experienced that kind of negative relationship towards money. So normalize to talk about uh, the negative sides and the risks of uh, using these technologies as well. That is my answer. Thank you. I already asked Sebastian on his views on the effects on B2B solutions. We want to dive into that again. Matthias, what do you think about this? So I, I forgot to unmute myself there for a moment, but I'm, I'm back now. Um, I think uh, I think it is. Uh, I think there are so many perspectives on, on this that are interesting and and I come back to the to to the cash as symbol uh, thinking here as well. But I actually wanted to uh, uh, to allude to something Sebastian was saying uh, as well on the question of what happens in to, in B two B. I think it was actually interesting is what happens to the parents or the people working in B two B when we have the fintech revolution uh, breaking through our 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 business life as well. I think. Uh, what is actually what we see happening right now is that you have a, a distribution of, um, of let's call it financial power or payment power or admin power, perhaps even uh, across the board. And I'm sure you, Sebastian, see a lot of this as well in, in, in your customers that, that actually the financial questions is not uh, generally a question only for um, for the people inside the organization that are tasked with finance necessarily. And what you'll find, so 
I just wanted to mention that because I think that is an interesting pivot back to uh, to what happens with the buy now, pay later, and that that credit discussion. Now we are not a, a consumer company. We do not offer buy now, pay later for for obvious reasons. A lot of our customers do, of course. But I what I think is interesting with rethinking credit as well with fintech. Um, as uh, as a vehicle for it is that we can break things down uh, a bit. So buy now, pay later is one example. But when that moves into the business to business context, we can actually see that short term credits are very very interesting. And we're launching a short term credit product right now that makes a huge difference for our customers uh, that has a lot of capital bound up in inventory or with payment gateways or or similar things. So I think what happens at large when we actually have some creativity around uh, payments and credits and when that hits business life and business to business life are two things. A, uh, a lot of people just working at a company are suddenly tasked with finance or find them themselves working in finance, even though they were just, just recently in marketing. And B, I think we also see a lot of creative solutions that is actually making less harm than what you may see in the buy now, pay later situation with consumers or young people being, being affected. I think actually the creativity on fintech will do a lot more good in business life than uh, so the downsides for, for, for that we've seen in, in consumer life with the same services. So I think that is ex exciting. So both democratic uh, democratization of finance or being tasked with finance and also being handed power and new tools that will help your business. So I think I'm quite excited, to be honest. Thank you. Uh, one last question. Uh, this one, uh, unfortunately, has to be a bit quick. Um, the finance sector used to be dominated almost entirely by banks, as Per explained, and we mentioned earlier. Um, Paul and Christopher, uh, what are you thinking about how fintech companies and banks are actually working together in regard to these new technologies? And what are the challenges and opportunities in that aspect? Uh, Paul, maybe you want to go first. Yeah, so... I, I think that if you look at the way that the fintechs, fintechs aren't actually that new, right? Financial technology, PayPal is a fintech. They've been around for quite some time. But what we've seen is a, a disruptive innovation trend that's happening, which generally tends to be a good thing in any industry. The only difference is that the banking industry, the financial industry is heavily regulated. And there is a symbiosis that's being built between fintechs that are driving innovation from a technology perspective, and traditional banking uh, organizations that understand how to operate with inside of a heavily regulated industry. And those two coming together is what's giving us some fantastically interesting uh, transitions and new innovative solutions going forwards. I also think that if you look at the, the, the most sort of grouping of fintechs today, they are attacking what we traditionally have seen as low hanging fruits or very simple banking processes, payments, uh, account aggregation, etc. Whereas for most banks, most of their revenue is still sitting in complex products, things like insurance, investment, etc. And so we'll continue, I think, to see a separation where uh, fintechs will focus currently on the more uh, simple products, and the banks will continue working on the, the complex products. But we will see this collaboration continuing to go forwards. Thank you. Christopher, do you want to go as well? Yeah. Well, first of all, I think banks have a huge responsibility uh, in regards of innovation and financial inclusion because uh, they are the gatekeepers of the current financial system and they get to decide who can participate and uh, uh, what financial services will be available. Uh, and clearly, there has been an unsatisfied demand there from the customer side. And that's why we're seeing a completely new financial system being built uh, by the fintech community and the crypto community. And there you have both very simple financial products and uh, very complicated products, um, uh, as you can see in like DeFi and, and smart contracts. So lately, we've seen the customers and the end user moving their money like never before into this space. And yeah, you might ask yourself why they're doing it. Well, it's, it's just better. 
Uh, for instance, if I'm, uh, for an example, if I'm sending money to a friend in the United States, why would I use the old banking system? It takes a couple of days. It's expensive. It's complicated. I can use a Bitcoin not a Lightning Network, which is instant. It's virtually free and it's uh, verifiable on a public blockchain. So the banks are lagging behind a little bit on innovation, but they have this nice infrastructure that millions of people depend on and are part of. So the banks need to integrate and open up their systems for their customers to use this new financial system. And if they did that, it would be huge opportunities with collaboration and that would benefit the end customer in the end. And we definitely see this happening, more banks taking on fintech companies and, and crypto also, uh, but not so much in Sweden. Most of the banks here are strongly anti-crypto. They uh, make it very difficult to fintech companies to integrate their systems. Um, but with legislation like PSDT, uh, PSD2, uh, we've seen them being forced to open up their APIs. And out of that, we've seen services like Revolut and Trustly really making banking better and more available for everyone. So from my experience, fintech companies would love to work closer with the banks, but the banks just need to open up a little bit more because that's going to benefit everyone in the end and definitely the end customer. Thank you all. Uh, now we've been here for around an hour and had a great panel discussion. And that actually means that we are jumping into our next session with a more international perspective. Uh, 